Let's stand and sing. Turning to Psalm 25, we're concluding this psalm this morning, and it certainly has been a blessing to my heart. Many lessons as I've studied through it over the past four weeks. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. And he's come into the presence of the Lord. He's worshiping God. He's stating these wonderful truths and principles of how to live in a godly way, how to honor the Lord with our lives. And now we come to the closing part of the psalm, and we come down to verse number 15 and God's word says mine eyes are ever toward the Lord for he shall pluck my feet out of the net turn thee on to me and have mercy upon me for I am desolate and afflicted the troubles of my heart are enlarged oh bring thou me out of my distresses look upon mine affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins Consider mine enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with a cruel hatred. O oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of all his troubles. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank thee 
for the reading of thy word, for the singing of thy praises. And we do pray that at this time thou will empty me of self and sin and fill me with thy spirit. Give me help to deliver the word of God to the glory of thy name. O Lord, speak, we pray. Speak, Lord, for thy children are listening. Speak, Lord, for we need a word in season. Speak, Lord, because we need thy truth. And therefore, bless us as we come around this holy book, the living word of the living God. Be glorified. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen and amen. Coming toward the end of the psalm, the psalmist makes a resolution, something that he is going to implement in his life. And it's found there in verse number 15. My eye or mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. He realizes that he cannot look to anything else or anyone else, even himself, to deliver him out of the troubles that he is in. And therefore, he makes this resolution, mine eyes are ever and will ever be toward the Lord. Can I say that that is one of the wisest things that any man or woman can say? Mine eyes will ever be on the Lord. Mine eyes. The importance of the correct focus. If you turn with me just for a moment, keeping your finger there to Genesis and the chapter number 13, we will find the eyes of men making decisions and the consequences of those decisions. Read from verse number 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere and before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest from Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plains of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abraham, or Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. There was a great decision to be made in life. The two groups were much too large to stay together. There was conflict between the servants of Lot and Abraham. And then in wisdom, Abraham says, look, I'll go one way, you go the other. And we'll establish ourselves and our families and all that we have. And we'll do it in relative peace and freedom because this is not working at all. And Lot looked up and the Bible says he lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan. Lot lifted up his eyes as far as the world. And he looked out, and physically speaking, it appeared attractive. It was very desirable. But all he did was lift up his eyes to see what he could see. Remember, God's thoughts are not our thoughts, and God's ways are not our ways. They are much higher than our ways. And whenever it comes to it, it's time to make decisions in life, we must lift our eyes onto the Lord and ask for his wisdom, for his direction, and for his understanding. You see, we read in this passage in chapter 13 of Abram's spirituality. Look at verse 3. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, onto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, onto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And Abram called on the name of the Lord. So we see Abram, he's lifting his eyes up to the Lord. He's calling upon the Lord for this decision. And God blessed Abram greatly because Abram was depending upon the Lord. Abram was depending upon the Lord's providence and in the Lord's will being revealed to him. He wasn't trying to get the best deal he could in his own eyes, but he left the choice in the hands of the Lord. And in doing so, he was richly, richly blessed. Because you know what the Lord said unto Abram in verse number 14? The Lord said unto Abram after that Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes. And look from the place where thou art northward and southward, eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed for ever. God told him, because you trust it in me, I will give thee much blessing. My friend, we have to say something very sad. 
because of Lot's decision that was made simply upon what he saw with his human eyes, Lot, in the long run, lost his family. He made a decision that day that he thought was good. He made a decision that day in which many people had supported him on. Humanly speaking, it seemed to be a good thing, an attractive thing, a comfortable thing to do. But rather than seek the Lord's leading, he went in his own wisdom. And that had an effect. And he lost his family. What you decide today will affect you and your family. The decisions you make will affect them. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but somewhere down the line, the implications of the decisions that you make will affect your family. And therefore, may God give us wisdom, not simply to choose what we think is best, but to leave the choice to him. Because God always blesses us with the best. Jim Elliot, the missionary that was murdered by the Aka Indians in the last century, He wrote these words in his journal. God always gives the best to those who leave the choice with him. And I urge you in all of your decisions, whatever it is, personally, for your family, for your career, for your church, all of those things, do not make decisions based on what you think is right. Leave the choice with God. And when he reveals his will, follow through. You see, we do not fully understand what the Lord is doing. We never will, I believe, until we get to eternity. Yes, there's things we look back on and we say, ah, I realize why that happened. But we really are in the dark on this side of eternity. I've quoted this poem before and I quote it again. My life is but a weaving between the Lord and me. I cannot choose the colors he weaveth steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow. And I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why. The dark threads are as needful as the weavers in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice with him. May God give us grace to go through with him, to obey and to yield. Turning back to Psalm 25, once again we want to think of those two words, mine eyes, and how important it is to have the right focus. I remember whenever the Lord Jesus Christ as a little boy, baby, was brought to the temple. And Simeon held him in his arms. And what did he say? Mine eyes have seen thy salvation. And if you're not saved this morning, the first thing you need to do is look upon the Lord in faith. That he is a savior who can save you from your sin. Your creator, your judge. The one who has died on the cross and shed his blood to deliver you. And then not only do you have that look of faith upon the Savior, you have to have discipline over your eyes in your Christian life. Listen to some of these verses. In Psalm 101, verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. God's people need to get to reality in the protection of their mind by disciplining their eyes. The will of the Lord is that we would see things that are pure and holy and beautiful and good. Therefore, don't set wickedness before your eyes. Don't watch that which is sinful. Don't read that which is wicked. Set no wicked thing before your eyes. We read in Psalm 119 verse 18, Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. There's a prayer every believer ought to pray as they come into the house of God. As they open up the word, In their time of personal study, Lord, open thou mine eyes. Now they're opened in salvation, but the prayer is that they be open to understanding, that we may behold wondrous things. Not that we just read and have some grasp, but that we read and discover who we are in Christ, what is provided for us in Christ, the glories of his riches, the promises that he has given. 
Then we think of those words in Psalm 121, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. And here we see the needful eyes, and there are times of need. And we need to make sure that in our times of need, as well as in our times of blessing, our eyes are on the Lord. And sometimes we take our eyes off of our Savior, and we look at our problems so greatly, and we magnify them so much that our problems become bigger in our mind than our God. But we need to lift up our eyes onto the hills, because that's where help comes from. The God who made heaven and the God who made earth. And may God give us grace to look upon the Lord as we are in the time of need. I would say one other thing. The Bible talks much about mine eyes in relation to the eyes of man. But it also speaks about the eyes of God. It speaks about the eyes of God. And in Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 17, it reads, For mine eyes are upon all thy ways. They are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from my eyes. And I am telling you this morning, whether you're saved or you're not saved, the eyes of the Lord are upon you. And dear sinner, as you go out of this place rejecting the gospel, as you go out of this place so glad to be out of the presence of the people of God and out from and under the teaching of truth, As you go to live your life in sin, remember this. The Lord says, mine eyes are upon all your ways. Neither is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. Friend, when you sin in word, God sees it. When you sin in thought, God sees it. When you sin in deed, God sees it. Not only does he see it, there's a record of it. Not only is there a record of it, but there's a day of recompense coming when you will stand before God and give an account for all of the sin that God has seen. I don't believe witnesses will be needed to be called forward. Because the greatest witness, the Lord Jesus, has seen it all. And therefore, if you're before the Lord this morning, and the eyes of God see a heart full of sin, rebellion, wickedness, immorality, filth, deceit. You need to come before the Lord and pray that he will cleanse you from your sin. That as he looks upon you, he will no longer see the sins that condemn you to hell, the sins that offend his holiness, the sins that separate between you and him, but rather he'll see the righteousness of Christ that is given to those who call upon the Savior. Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord. I challenge you, dear believer, when you wake up tomorrow in the will of God, pray that the Lord will protect your eyes to keep them focused upon him, that your heart will be filled with truth and not with the sin of this world. Verses 16 to 22 are a prayer. And in this prayer, there is... There are many petitions and many different things that he brings in. And I want us to look at this prayer under three simple headings. And I trust and pray that the Lord will encourage you and maybe give you instruction on how to pray and encouragement to pray because God hears and answers prayer. We're going to look first of all at verses 16, 17, and 18. And in these verses, there's a prayer for his own soul. As an individual, he prays for himself. Turn thee unto me, and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. O bring thou me out of my distresses. Look upon mine affliction and my pain, and forgive all my sin. Now, there's three things that he reveals before God here. And can I say God wants honesty in prayer? Because first of all, he knows everything anyway. But it's the will of the Lord that we would talk honestly and openly before our God. Remember the two in the road to Emmaus? He asked them what things troubled them. Now he knew, but he wanted them to share with him. And God wants us to share with him honestly. And David did not hold back here. He said, I am desolate. What does the word desolate mean? It means I feel alone. I feel alone. Well, if this was a psalm of David in the time whenever He was in the shepherd fields. Well, he was in a large family. 
There were plenty of people around him, but he felt alone. If it was whenever he was in the palace ruling the country, he had servants around him, family around him, children, all of those things, but he still felt alone. And even in the midst of a congregation like this, you might be sitting in God's house and you might feel alone. You might feel alone that nobody can comprehend what you're going through. Nobody can understand. They just seem to be going on with the service, going on with life. And you feel desolate and alone. Not only does he feel alone, but he says in verse 16, I'm afflicted. And also distressed in verse number 17, afflicted and distressed. And the idea of the word distressed there has the idea of being depressed, of being depressed in circumstances. Under circumstances you feel you can't handle. It also has the idea of being depressed in mind. In other words, you just don't see any hope in your situation. You don't see how there's going to be a resolution to this. You don't see how there's going to be an end to this. And you feel distressed and you feel depressed. He talks about the troubles of his heart in verse number 17. You know what the word troubles means? It means to be backed into a tight space. Have you ever said, I'm in a tight corner? Well, that's what it felt like. He felt he had nowhere to go. He had very few options. So he's alone. He's distressed. He's depressed. He's in a a tight space. He feels hurt because he says, look upon my afflictions and my pain. He feels hurt and he says, Lord, look. And what's he doing when he says, Lord, look? He's laying the issues of his heart before the Lord. Lord, look at my circumstances. I want to say that I know there is not one person or one household that escapes times of difficulty. There's not one in this congregation, no matter how joyful they appear to be, or are, I should say, no matter what you see of their life, there's not one person, but we face trouble and we face hurt. At times we feel alone, at times we feel distressed and even depressed. And perhaps you feel like you're the only one who has suffered or experienced such things. And that makes you feel isolated this morning and that no one else understands. And perhaps the devil has been having a field day with those thoughts. There must be something wrong with you. Look at the troubles you're going through. Look at the difficulties the Lord allows in your life. There must be something wrong with you. Or the devil go further. There must be something wrong with your God. How would a loving God allow you to go through these things? And friend, maybe you think, if I truly were saved, or if I truly was right with God, I wouldn't have these difficulties. I wouldn't have these afflictions. Turn over just a few verses to Psalm 34. Because in Psalm 34, the Spirit of God... answers this question. Verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. And there we have silenced Satan. We have used the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, to attack Satan and to close his mouth because many are the afflictions of the righteous. That's a fact Don't think there's something wrong with you. Don't think there's something lacking on the part of your heavenly father. Because many are the afflictions of the righteous, but look at the promise. The Lord delivereth him out of them all. What does the word delivereth mean? Well, it can mean to take out 
of the situation. God can take us out of the situation, or God can rescue us, or God can save us. But the word also means defend us and preserve us. God can defend you in the midst of your affliction. God will preserve you in the midst of your affliction. And let us look at the context Because it says in verse 17, the righteous cry and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. There's prayer. And I know whenever troubles come, it's maybe the most difficult thing to do. But friend, you need a call to God today. You need to pray and say, Lord, I am alone. I am distressed, depressed, hurt. I'm in a tight corner. I don't see any hope. I don't see any way through. But thy word says you will hear me and you will deliver me. Friend, you need to do that this morning. You were not made to carry the burdens of your life. That is why scripture tells us to cast our burden upon the Lord and he will sustain us. Look at the promise in verse number 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. Have you got a broken heart this morning? Is your heart breaking because of your circumstances? Is it breaking because of news you received? Is it breaking because of what lies ahead and you're so fearful? Jesus can work miracles today. A friend, the heart this morning that's full of fear, the Lord can fill with hope. The heart that's full of sadness, the Lord can give joy. The heart that is full of turmoil, the Lord can give peace. The heart that is full of hurt, the Lord can give healing. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. Say, no point in praying. That won't change my circumstances. And worry on. Listen, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. He'll hear the whisper. He'll hear the call, he'll hear the cry, and he will deliver, meaning he will preserve you, he will defend you, and if it's his will, he will take you right out of the situation or cause the situation to pass through. I'm glad this morning that not only do I call upon a God who sees and can deliver, but I call upon a God who has gone through all of these emotions. Christ knew what it was to be alone. He knew what it was to be distress as he suffered the agonies of hell upon the cross of Calvary. He knew what it was to be hurt as the very ones who said, oh, I'll go with thee even on to death they fled and with oaths and curses denied they ever knew him. And I encourage you this morning, whatever you're going through, Christ has gone through in a greater fashion. And he's able to preserve you and to keep you and to encourage you. He prayed for his own soul. Verses 19 to 21. Consider mine enemies, for they are many. They hate me with a cruel hatred. O keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. What do we learn from this? Well, this is a prayer for his testimony. Not just his soul, but for his testimony before man. He acknowledges that there are real enemies. Lord, consider my enemies. Now, there are three main enemies identified in the word of God. The world. And by the word world, we mean the system of the world the standards of the world, the way the world views things and the way the world promotes things, that is an enemy of God. It is an enemy of the child of God. We think of the flesh. And by the word flesh, we mean the sinful desires, whether it is immorality or whether it's to tell a lie or whether it is to blaspheme or whether it is to whatever. Any type of sin, any desire that you have, you can say that is the flesh raising his head and that's an enemy of the child of God. Then, of course, there is the devil. And there are temptations that the devil brings before us. There are things that are brought before us to to discourage us, to hurt us. And there are also individuals that can come before us as our enemies. What do I mean by that? I mean men or women or young people who set themselves against the Christian 
and they mistreat the Christian for no other reason other than the fact you're a Christian. And you know that. You've gone to workplaces, you've gone into school, and people have heard that you're a born-again Christian, and automatically their attitude towards you changes. You can see it in their face. Their face falls. They're disappointed. Some are angry. You notice that their attitude towards you changes. You hear the snide comments. Maybe you feel excluded from the group because they don't want anything to do with you. Why? Because they hate Christ. They hate his church. And therefore they hate you. It says here, there are many enemies and that they hate me with a cruel hatred. The word cruel is an interesting word because it has the idea of wishing harm on someone. They don't just hate him, but they wish him to be harmed because he's a Christian. It also can mean to make false claims or to do wrong towards him. So you know what it's like. False accusation has been made against you by those who hate the gospel, hate the Christ. Sometimes it can be as simple as, oh, you Christians just think you're everything. You're the best and everybody below you is worthless. And you have such an attitude. You're so full of yourself. Friend, the Christian who's walking with the Lord, that's not the way they are at all. We know we're sinners. We know we deserve hell. We know we're nothing but sinners saved by the grace of God. And we're simply seeking to live in a way that pleases and honors your Savior. The reality is, it offends them. Because they know what we're doing. We're following truth. And they don't want it. They love darkness rather than light. But friend, it can come further than that. It can be false accusation made against the believer. False accusation made to defame him, to destroy him or her. And there can even be physical harm. Not only are there real enemies, but praise God, there is help in the midst of the attack of the enemy. Verse 20, Oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. Keep my soul. The word keep means to hedge about, to guard or to preserve me. Do you see the theme here? We need to daily pray that the Lord would guard us and protect us and preserve us. Now we know he will, but that we would walk about with an awareness that we are surrounded by a hedge of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the hands of God, that we are in his will and we are in his way. I love Isaiah 43. I don't think there are better verses that we could turn to in any time of trouble or distress. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou walkest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When they walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee, for I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. And what is being said here is that the Lord promises to go with you through the trial. Whenever the enemy is attacking, the Lord is with you and he will bring you through. The enemy will not overcome. He will not win. And what does the psalmist do in this case? He says, I put my trust in thee. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait on thee. And the word wait means to patiently tarry. It means to expect from God. To have faith that God will bring you through. There's a lovely meaning to the word wait that we don't often know, but it's in the meaning of the word in the Hebrew. It means to bind together. To bind together. Is that not a beautiful picture of what happens when we wait upon the Lord whenever we come to the place of prayer? We grow closer to the Lord. We go closer to the Lord. And do we not need to be continually growing closer to the Lord in the place of prayer? And he's saying, I put my trust in thee. That literally means I'm fleeing to thee for protection. I'm fleeing to thee to be a refuge in my time of trouble. I'm confiding in you, Lord. And he prays for two things. He prays for integrity and he prays for uprightness. Integrity means innocence. Lord, keep me holy in the midst of this battle. Temptations are hurled at me. Accusations are hurled at me. Oh, Lord, you know that the flesh even is rising up trying to get the victory, but Lord, keep me holy 
Integrity means to be innocent. It means to be complete. It means simplicity. It means simplicity. And friend, in the midst of battle, we need that simplicity of just having this one focus. Lord, keep me holy. Keep me faithful. Keep me obedient to where you would have me to be. The word upright simply, or uprightness, means exactly what it says. Keep me doing that which is right. Now you will notice that he doesn't pray that he will, that he will get one over on his enemies. And the anger of the flesh doesn't come up. Well, I hope they get everything they deserve. But he prays that the Lord would deal with him, first of all. Now, why does he not pray that the, he will get won over in his enemies, but that the Lord will keep him during the attack? I'll tell you why. And listen very carefully to this. The Lord will deal with all of our enemies. The Lord will deal with all of our enemies. And sometimes people have snapped under pressure and they've lashed out in anger and they've gone against someone or something and in the process they may have felt good for a little while but they destroyed their testimony. Here's wisdom. Lord, keep me right in the midst of the trial. I know I'm going through it. I know I will come to the other side. And Lord, my enemy, I leave in your hands. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7, and we're almost through. Deuteronomy and the chapter number 7, verse 9. Knoweth therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations, and repayeth them that hate him to their face, to destroy them. He will not be slack to them that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. The enemies of God will one day stand before the face of the Lord. And to their face, he will judge them. To their face, he will repay them. And every wrong will be put right on that day. Romans 12, 19, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. A friend, if you're under attack this morning and there are enemies that are troubling you, leave it in the hands of the Lord. Pray that God will preserve you, your testimony, your walk, your joy in the midst of the trial. And leave the retribution in the hands of the one who is worthy to deal with enemies. Finally, there's a prayer for his nation. Verse 22, redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Israel at this time is in a state of trouble. Why? Why is Israel in a state of trouble? Very simple, because of the disobedience of the people. The disobedience of the people of a land leads to trouble. You see, in Psalm 33, 12, it says, blessed is that nation whose God is the Lord. But whenever you turn away from God, and put God behind you and live to your own right and wrong, live to your own standards, live to your own laws, what are you doing? You're putting yourself in the place of God. And there's no blessing in a land where the rule of God is not found. And what we need today in our land is for a nation to be turned back to God. The troubles of the land come from the disobedience of the people. The troubles of the land are sent as punishment and as a warning. Remember the plagues of Egypt, how they started. And they grew and they grew and they grew and they grew till the final plague came, death. My friend, the Lord allows lands to be troubled. Well, they're through famine. Pestilence, war, tragedy. 
that he might turn them back to himself. You see, the troubles of this land can only be overcome by the help of God. You can educate the people of Northern Ireland, but they'll be educated sinners. You can help the people of Northern Ireland financially, but they will be rich sinners. You can provide activities and entertainment for the people of Northern Ireland, but they'll be entertained sinners. What do the people of this nation need today? They need the Lord. They need the mercy, the grace, and the forgiveness of God. Our land, no matter who is in control, will not be fixed by a government policy, document, or manifesto. Every politician in this land could be in agreement over some particular point, yet the land still lost in sin. We need Jesus. We need the Lord. And the need of our land is for God's people to do what David did. Pray for their own selves that they'll get right with God. Pray that their testimony will be protected in the midst of conflict and pray that God would save their land. Not just the tribe or the people that you belong to, politically or religiously, but God will save our land. Everyone. All nations, all groups will be reached. All backgrounds would be penetrated by the power of God that their identity would no longer be Protestant or Catholic. Their identity would be, I'm born again, child of God. Not an earthly title that they take delight in, but a heavenly one. And friend, God can do this, but the question is this, are you willing to pray? Are you willing to be part of of the instrument that brings in God's blessing and revival to Margaret to Northern Ireland, to this church? Are you willing to make a sacrifice, to get down upon your knees and to seek the face of God because God rewards those that seek him? Are you willing to sit back and say, well, you know what? What a state this place has been in. It's been like this for the past hundred years. It's going to be no better. If David was led by the Spirit of God to pray that the Lord would redeem the land, then we ought to be doing the same thing. Lord, redeem us. Save us. Deliver us. Because we need the Lord. We're going to conclude this morning by singing just a couple of verses of our closing hymn. And it says in 574, when the storms of life are raging, tempest wild and land or sea, I will seek a place of refuge in the shadow of God's hands. And we'll sing uh, verse number one, three and four, and then we'll remain standing for prayer. down and sing.
Heavenly Father, we're so thankful this morning for the hope and the confidence that the children of God can have in their Heavenly Father. The Lord, you will hide us and preserve us. The Lord, even in the midst of trial and difficulty, the great defender is hedging us round about. And we do pray, Lord, that you will keep our testimonies. Keep us holy. Lord, we pray that you'll keep us faithful. Lord, we pray that you'll give us a, a burden upon our heart to pray for our land. Lord, this land is going to hell. Our loved ones, our family, our friends. Oh God, give us a burden to pray. May we see through the preaching of God's word here, even through the mission that's coming up, a mighty move of God saving our people, bringing them into the family of God. And Lord, we're so thankful and grateful this morning that as we would resolve afresh to keep our eyes upon the Lord, we know that his eyes are always upon us. His ears open to our cry. Oh Lord, we're so blessed this morning. Help us to live in the freedom, the freedom and the blessing of the gospel, knowing that nothing can harm us in the hands of God. Lord, save the lost, we pray. Don't allow any to leave here, going out into this wicked, wicked world without having a heavenly Father, one who has died to save them, the Spirit of God dwelling within. Work this morning. Unite us in the Lord, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.